Agent Carter, the 2015-2016 TV show. Spoiler-free review. So, I'm going to start by telling you this was a show that I absolutely loved. This video will have some jokes, none of the expensive members of minorities, and we'll get into some serious topics. And, yeah, I realize this video is long, but I can't make it worth your time. And, let's see, yes, this video is a review where I'm almost definitely not going to spoil anything, but I, if I decide over the course of the video to do so, I'm going to verbally warn for it to do so, hold up an index finger so you can mute and skip ahead and you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn for spoilers for earlier entries in the MCU. And let's see. Yes, if you want my spoiler thoughts on episodes, the link to them will be in the description box. This. Let's see. Right, yes. Um, I have watched every episode once each, and I record this fairly shortly after finishing the finale. There are. 18 episodes total, and see, yeah, um, this follows the first Captain America movie, and does not really, you know, yeah, other than that one, there's not a lot here that, you know, yeah, that that was where Peggy was featured in her in her youth. So though other MCU movies have come out, you know, after that one before this show, you don't really have to, you know, have have watched those. And you can go into this not having watched Captain America One, though emotionally it's not gonna have the same impact. And yeah, so this the show was created by Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. That's an unfortunate last name. Who, of course, co-wrote the first Captain America movie. So, you know, they they are responsible for, you know, bringing Peggy Carter from the page to the screen. And... Yeah, so the the two season openers are both really good. Uh, you know, you quickly get a sense of the the new status quo. You know, it's not quite the same as last we saw Peggy in in either of them. And yeah, they they provide a hook for the overall season and the season, both seasons do a good job following up on the hook. It never just becomes a completely different show, which can be quite frustrating when shows pull that kind of thing. And both finales are also quite good, uh, wrapping up their individual seasons. Technically, season two does end on somewhat of a cliffhanger, but the fact that you know, it's possible it'll never be resolved, though it is also, you know, Disney, hypothetically, there might be a Disney Plus sp special thing that resolves, you know, but, yeah, if you really hate cliffhangers, you're you're going to want to stop watching at the end of season one, which does not feature that, yeah, no, no cliffhanger ending there, not even one that's resolved in, in season two. But, you know, I'm someone who usually really can't stand cliffhangers, and I was very happy that I watched all the way through. You know, it's like, I did it because I want to try to review... Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm reviewing basically everything MCU. So I had already planned on watching all the way through, but... This is very much a case where, you know, hypothetically, let's say I had a time machine, could go back, keep myself from watching. I'm really, I, I wouldn't, I'm really happy that I watched it. It's really, it's, there's a, the fact that the cliffhanger has currently, you know, the, the show ended, let's see, seven years ago, 
has not been resolved yet, may never be resolved. At least there might not be some canon thing that, you know, it's not a huge problem. It's, it's a, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, obviously the, the thing that frustrated some fans, and I'm going off a Reddit post here, is that people knew that the show was ending. So they basically, they did that thing sometimes TV people do, which can be very annoying, where they worry that a show is being cancelled, so they throw in a cliffhanger to try to get people so excited that the network just feels, oh, we guess we can't cancel it, but it ended up getting cancelled anyway. You know, has happened many, many times. I really, really resent when, when like, I think you should only do a cliffhanger if you know that you're going to get to resolve it. But, yeah, the cliffhanger's not, like, you know, the, the cliffhangers Alias would do, which, you know, thankfully those were all resolved. Those were, you know, much more. It's like, you know, if you don't watch the next, if you don't watch the resolution of the cliffhanger, it's gonna just drive you bonkers. This one, it's, it's fine. You know, it's basically just, there's some setup for future story, but it's not, yeah. Um, that brings us to, yes, so, yeah, I, I love seeing female empowerment, and uh, let's see, yeah, there, there are several major similarities to Alias, you know, Carter works as a spy, but there's a front for it. Some of the people in her personal life have no idea and think the job she has is no big deal. You know, the, one of them has a line like, you know, it's not life or death, it's just a phone company. And let's see... Uh, yes, sometimes Peggy uses her non-threatening appearance to get into areas that she definitely isn't allowed in. Gets men to lower their guard because they're attracted to her. <coughs> there are some gadgets. Disguise. And let's see. Yeah, so, you know, the biggest differences are probably, between this and Alias are probably, it's way less convoluted and there are far fewer chronological jumps. The show has dialogue that really fits the time period, very witty and using slang from back then. It was created by the two writers of the first Captain America movie who also defined the character of Peggy Carter in the MCU. It's very clear they love the character. The show is very much interested in improving the conditions of women. That's definitely great. I'm completely in agreement on that goal. I don't think it always goes about it in the best way. There are definitely times where it comes down to the show depicting success in having Peggy do minor displays of being really capable at certain things. There will be sexist words and actions directed at her and other women. She will have a quippy response or use her femininity in order to get one over on the men, which might send the message that a woman who isn't sufficiently feminine is not good enough at being a woman. And also there's a similar problem when she uses her sexuality at one point she gets some time off so she can engage in espionage by implying she has her period or something along those lines, which gets the men who hear that to groan, which is really not super empowering. Right, and I should, um, I gotta get better at saying this, everything I say about feminism, I'm not trying to mansplain feminism, I'm not trying to tell anyone, any woman how to run the movement. Everything I say about feminism is based on something I've heard women feminists say. I, I acknowledge that, you know, anything I, you know, I'm, I'm applying tools that they've given me. I'm not saying that if I came up with my own tools that that would mean as much. You know, I as a cis man can't completely, you know, I, I, can, I can try, I can get some of the way, but I'll never fully know what it's like to, to be a, a cis woman. Now, let's see, yeah. <clears throat> There's also one point where a male character tries to help by calling out the sexism. This, the show itself, 
does have Peggy ask him not to, and yes, I appreciate some people would probably think that that's the kind of thing I do. I try very hard to always base the things I say in support of women to be... I already said this. Anyway, things that I know feminist women have said, I think the perspective matters tremendously. The women's movement should not be defined by men. When I said that before, I forgot that I already wrote this. Anyway, um, let's see. Yeah, so <clears throat> back to the positives. Well-choreographed action. Sometimes the environment is used really well. Peggy may not be as strong as a lot of the men she fights, but if she hits them against a heavy object like a refrigerator, that can help even things out. Though there are also times where she just sucker punches, which, again, yo, right, I have something written about that later in this, so... Peggy herself is incredibly classy, and yeah, you know, I mentioned the, the show features some cool gadgets. Of course, they're not the exact same that you'd find in something set in the present. They do a good job at making it credible that this is something that would exist in, at least in the MCU at this time, which, you know, the MCU has, oh, you know, has, has long had, you know, science stuff that we don't in real life. Um, Edwin Jarvis, a character established to be a good person, references help, you know, yeah, he, he does housework, and he doesn't whine about it, he's not like, oh, that's just women's work. Daniel Souza is one of the relatively few men who has faith in Peggy. He has a leg injury, which makes other people think less of him as well, so he has more empathy. This is often the case in real life as well. And they, you know, they make sure that Souza is not just a prop for this political message. He has personality. And let's see... So, yes, the, the show is willing to explore that Howard Stark is not merely a bad father, which by this point was very clear in the MCU. He might actually be kind of a bad person, which I seriously respect any MCU property for confronting. So, yeah, Jarvis, Edwin Jarvis, very stiff, uptight person. He's really not used to anything that isn't neat and tidy being considered okay, much less desirable, which contrasts well with Peggy's anything the mission requires is on the table approach and the two have a very fun odd couple dynamic Let's see and and yeah you know i quite appreciate that the you know the character who's not an amazing spy is a man and the one who is an amazing spy is a woman at first, characters may appear to be fairly straightforward. Many of them later reveal complexity that was not immediately evident. The show does definitely try to criticize misogyny of the time and general of Howard Stark, but it does also go along with Howard Stark's misogyny. The many women he was with were conquests, not people to him or to the show. We're supposed to watch and think, wow, that guy sure was great without thinking about the women except for sometimes when they're made out to be really harsh when it comes to not taking it well that Howard broke up with them. And Edwin Jarvis is not criticized that much for his help with that. Like, it, you know, yeah, it's a very mixed bag with, with that. Peggy makes it clear very early in the show that she's striving to be as incredible of a person as Steve Rogers was even after his apparent death. He continues to inspire her to be better. While I don't love having a female character be motivated entirely by a man, it is great to see Steve Rogers' effect on people like this, which is not something we had really seen in the movies before this came out. The, the first Captain America movie does have a little bit of that. When it comes to the issue of gender, some people lack confidence more than they actually have a problem with their gender. For example, if they're a girl, whether trans or cis, they might try to reject that. And let's be honest, and again, I'm speaking generally, not universally. It's not like not like other girls. Girls are not like other girls, are uncomfortable with being a girl so much as it's that they're taught it's bad to be a girl. The definition of what girls are like is limited or limiting, and the things that they are are considered girly and therefore bad. 
The show says that Peggy is the closest that Howard comes to respecting a woman that isn't his mother, and while that's, of course, nice for her and could engender more respect in a number of audience members who would not respect her, if not for that, that does still mean that the show confirms that basically half the entire human population does not have the respect of Howard Stark, the smartest man, when they could easily have tried to retcon it and say, actually, he does respect women. That's part of why he seduces so many. He's attracted to their intelligence. Although I acknowledge that might be as awkward as when Star Trek Enterprise tried to retcon around slave girls. I do still think it would be better than we what we got here. And, you know, by this point, the MCU was clearly willing to, to retcon at least some stuff. You know, this show started airing in 2015, 2013, saw the release of Iron Man 3, where the depiction of the Mandarin left a lot of hardcore fans really unhappy. So, you know, not very long after, they made Hail to the King, a Marvel one-shot, which completely retcons, you know, yeah, says, no, 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 the Mandarin is out there, this is not the Mandarin, don't worry. You know, I, I wouldn't call that one a, an awkward retcon, but it's definitely a significant retcon. You know, if you only watch Iron Man 3 and you don't know about Hail to the King, yeah, that movie leaves you thinking, there's, you know, this is the closest we're going to get to the Mandarin in the MCU. The show makes it clear that despite how capable Peggy is, almost no men respect her or listen to her or treat her as a fellow agent. Even though she earned that, some of the time this allows her to work in secret because they don't think of her as capable. They don't act like she needs to be kept out of confidential matters. And I definitely do appreciate a story about sexism and misogyny that makes it clear that this woman character is capable. We never feel like they're right not to trust her. And they do also manage to give her character flaws, make her interesting. And I'm not saying that strong female characters that don't have personality are lesser than male characters who are strong and don't have personality. They're both really bland. Conservatives do hold them to a different standard, so I'm addressing that. I'm not sure there's really any major character on this show that isn't interesting, whether man or a woman. You know, and I, I do personally think the MCU has been consistently great on the you know, no matter how strong of a woman character is, they're, they're still making sure that there is some character flow, there is something interesting to her beyond. You know, she's, she's impressive for other... She's a... yeah. She's impressive as far as strength goes, but there are other issues where she's actually a compelling fictional character. You know, I'm, I'm not... Let's see. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, in real life, women should be constantly apologizing for existing. But when it comes to fiction, it is more interesting for a character to have some character flaw. I'm not entirely sure why I'm so much more comfortable with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Sky, and Melinda May beating up men than Peggy Carter. It's not the the, actor, the the actors involved. Maybe it's something about the way they carry themselves. Like, compare the way that Sky moves after she's had her agent training to the way she moved before it. Peggy moves in a fairly regular civilian woman way. I suppose it might be to disarm, and I guess I just feel like there's too big of a contrast between those two things. It's not the fact that Peggy is not respected by her male peers where May and Skye are. That's obviously an important aspect of the show. The show's makeup, they're commenting on sexism and misogyny, and in real life, there are in fact a lot of women who are incredibly capable, including more capable than the men around them, and they're not given the respect that they clearly earn, whereas mediocre men are handed respect and opportunities just for being straight white cis and male. And, yeah, the show has a pretty good amount of women characters. There's even a few scenes where there's more women characters than male characters. And, you know, some of, sadly not all, but some of the, the women characters on the show do get to be very compelling. 
Unfortunately, some are treated with misogyny from the show itself. This includes some of them being walking, talking, misogynistic tropes. And Yeah, there's at least one woman on the show that is clearly extraordinary, but she's being weighed down by the mediocre men around her, their lack of ability and or willingness to recognize this disparity. Much like the Netflix Marvel shows, Marvel Netflix shows, I can never remember, as well as Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., this has some deeply compelling women villains. The show does acknowledge that some women do want to be domestic, and there's nothing at all wrong with wanting that. There's nothing wrong with those women. The important thing is that nobody is forced into that, which, you know, I want to say it's, is it girl boss feminism? I forget exactly what, there's a, there's a name for that strain of feminism, which, you know, yeah, the, there was a while where it was seen as, you know, no women, no woman should be domestic, which, you know, that's, that's limiting in a different direction. The important thing is nobody's forced into... Yeah. Now, the... Let's see... Yeah. Um, the show does a good job showing the, the grief. You know, several characters are, you know, yeah, grieving the loss of Steve Rogers. And I, th uh, I don't want to give away. Yeah, there's there's other grief as well, and yeah, they they definitely do. You know, yeah, they get across that though the person is dead, they still have an effect on. You know, obviously, it's not through what they're doing right now, but the the things they did and said when they were alive affects the way that the characters feel and behave, you know, n yeah, now that they're gone. And let's see, there is a um yeah um the the second season does have a little bit of i want to say it's called sophomore slump there's i i wouldn't bring it up if this would like if i don't think it's a huge deal but i do find it frustrating because i don't think you know i haven't watched every single mcu show yet there are a few that are coming up where that that have more than one season you know but of the ones that i've watched that have more than one season so this is agents of shield which i've watched the first 3 seasons of and marvel netflix which i've watched all of those have really excellent follow up seasons you know it's like iron fist season 2 is much better than iron fist season 1 and for the other ones, it's not always like I'm. I'm. It's not. They're not always better, but they're not like hugely. Yeah, it's not that season two of this show is like terrible, but it does make several decisions where it feels like the show struggled in ratings. You know, so so. They try to, yeah, like, certain characters in Season 2 are pushed, like, for, for like, comic relief. They're, they're pushed further in a way that, I, I don't, I don't want to give away what character, because then you'll know, oh, I guess that character's still alive by Season 2. And, you know, you won't worry about their safety when there's scenes of them in danger. But... At least one of these cases, it's a character who, in season one, they found a really good balance. They they didn't push it too far for co comic relief. And I, yeah, I'm 
season two does not really do the the grief part quite as much. And there's a couple of things where it just it feels a little like they're trying to be flashier. It doesn't like scuttle the show, it doesn't completely destroy, but I think the show would have been better if if not. But with that said, season two has all of my favorite episodes thinking about it. And this is also one of those things where I would say it took them a little while for the show to completely find its feet. It it wasn't one hundred percent where it needed to be. They were they were kinda they were trying stuff out, they were trying to get to a point where it felt you know and and that's I think Agents of Shield did that much quicker. I would I would probably say Agents of Shield it was maybe around the halfway point of the first season, and I, I can absolutely see a case for it being even faster than that, where with this show, I, I really, I feel like it was maybe two-thirds in, which is obviously, that does not leave a huge amount of episodes that were like, you know, just, just blow you away. Um, let's see, right, and, and on the, on that subject, this is not really a show where you can just jump around in, you know, just watch an episode or two here or there, you know, it's either, like, you can watch, let's see, I want to say season one is like eight episodes, hold on, season one is eight episodes, you can stop after that, or you can watch the entire 18 episode run, which, you know, it's not completely impossible. It's insurmountable. You know, each episode is roughly 40 minutes. So, yeah, you can knock it out in, you know, over over a weekend. But, yeah, this is not the, you know, some shows where you can just jump around and just watch the episodes that you think sound interesting and not really be, like, confused you know, stuff like the animated 90s X-Men show, you have the, I guess, more or less every animated Star Wars show, really. I, uh, I don't know for sure about Ewoks and droids, but certainly the rest of them, yeah, you can kind of just dip in and out. Which, you know, is is reassuring for, you know... The Clone Wars has seven seasons, so you know not everybody's going to want to sit down for, you know, yeah, that many episodes. Although I I feel like a couple of those seasons are not like twenty two episode ones, but still, it's a it's a lot. Love that show. Don't get me wrong. So uh, agents, yeah, uh, Haley Atwell returns as Peggy Carter. Because of extensive fan demand, I don't know anyone who doesn't love her performance as this character. Uh, you know, this is, she's one of those characters, I th she might be, like, the only MCU character where it really is, like, how do you get her back? Like, are you gonna, how, how many stories are you gonna set, you know, decades, you know, almost a century before the Avengers assemble? You know, in in the MCU, not in the comics, but in the MCU, the the Avengers did not assemble until like 2011, 2010, something. I forget exactly what the timeline. At first, I thought the movies were just gonna be oh, you know, the year that it's released is the year that it's set, but that's not completely. But anyway, you know, yeah, how many stories are you gonna set? The the Avengers are the big draw here. You know, the, right from the start, you know. I'd like to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. This this was the big hook. You know, other than the fact that the first Iron Man is legitimately a really great movie. But yeah, they keep finding ways to bring back Haley Atwell playing Peggy Carter, and I'm here for it. Now she let's see, yeah, she's an SSR agent stuck doing administrative work. And let's see. So yeah, some some Wikipedia quoting here. Uh, it was been it said of uh, yeah her superpowers the fact that other people underestimate her and she often uses that to her advantage. 
on the influence that the apparent death of Steve Rogers has on Carter, Atwell explained he was the greatest person she ever knew, even before he took the serum and became Captain America. She knew his character, and she saw kindred spirit in him, so I think she's grieving the loss of him, but she's also determined to make sure that his work wasn't in vain. That gives her a tremendous amount of determination to carry on, despite the obstacles that she comes across. And Gabriella Graves portrays a young Carter. And that is, of course, that's a big thing, you know. Some people would say, why even watch the show? You know, like, yeah, it's not a spoiler to say. Obviously, Captain America himself, Steve Rogers, is not going to appear. How would he? He's in the ice. You know, we, we know that he doesn't, they, they don't find him until the, the yeah, like 2010 or 2008, I guess, because I feel like I heard that he was thawed not long after or right before Tony became Iron Man. Anyway, something like that, you know, so, you know, that, like, as, as great as Haley Atwell as Peggy Carter is, you know, people went to that first Captain America movie for Chris Evans as Steve Rogers, not for, for Peggy, and this show, it's about Peggy, yeah, the, the, th one of the things is we see this, yeah, the effect that he had on the people around him, and the, yeah, the, the, this thing of, you know, there's still important things to do back then you know it's it's one of those where like you know sure you've never heard about this but it, it's the ssr why would you have heard it's top secret here's what happened you know here's how the world was saved before the avengers you know james darcy plays edwin jarvis howard stark's butler an ally to carter and yeah um, eventually he will tutor Tony Stark and inspire his Jarvis artificial intelligence. Atwell referred to Carter's relationship with Jarvis as the series comic relief. She needs someone who is in contact with Howard to help run this kind of mission. And they have this very witty banter back and forth. And let's see, yeah, and some of the characters' persona has come from the comics, some of it we've developed ourselves, some of it's influenced by James Darcy himself and his strengths. Darcy was initially nervous about portraying Jarvis on comedic side, given his history of predominantly playing psychopaths. I, I, haven't, I haven't seen him in anything else. I, that's very difficult for me to imagine. I, I think I've seen, like, a clip in a, in a YouTube video that... Talk about you know he normally plays psychopaths. It's just I, I'd like to see it because it's it's gonna be wild for me to see, yeah. He did not uh, Dame Darcy did not James Darcy did not study Paul Bettany's performance as Jarvis when approaching the character. And I I yeah I'm not sure it would have made a ton of sense for him to to do that. Um, so yeah. And, and definitely, they are very distinct characters. You know, I've, I've always felt like the AI Jarvis, which, you know, now we have to... Now we have to specify that before this show, when we were talking to MCU, and you said Jarvis, oh, you mean the AI. Anyway, AI Jarvis seems more like, basically, like Tony messed around with AI until he found a personality that he, you know, he doesn't like having boring people around him. The fact that AI Jarvis is always snarking at him, you know, yeah, that it keeps him on his toes. That's the kind of, you know, he has that banter with everyone he talks to. He doesn't want an AI that's just going to be like, yes, sir. You know, it's, you know, peak, peak AI Jarvis is the, the, you know, the third solo Iron Man movie where... You know, Tony thinks, oh, I'm, I'm nailing this, this, you know, suit that comes to me in pieces. And then, you know, he, he, it, yeah, he falls over, the, the suit falls apart, and Jarvis just dryly states, as always, a great pleasure watching you work, sir. You know, that's, yeah, that's AI Jarvis. Edwin Jarvis, 
there's some snark towards Howard and, and others, but yeah, they're very different characters. Chad Michael Murray plays Jack Thompson. I gotta say, I for a while, I hadn't seen him in anything other than One Tree Hill. I'm really, really enjoying his post One Tree Hill stuff. You know, I, I, yeah, sue me. I was a teenager once. I watched One Tree Hill. I think I watched like three or four seasons, something like that, you know. Yeah, I liked him fine as, as Lucas Scott on there. Um, oh, right, House of Wax. I completely forget, yeah. That movie is not as bad as it as it could be. Um, he's in something called Fortress 3, but apparently it has nothing to do with the... Oh, yeah, he's in various other Fortress movies, but they don't have anything to do... Yeah. No connection to the... Um, the sci-fi Fortress movies, which is too bad. Anyway, um, yeah, you know, other than, yeah, I've, I've seen him in, in this and Scream Queens, where, you know, to, to be clear, he's not in a huge amount of, of Scream Queens, but what he's got there is fantastic. But, but yeah, um, really, really enjoying this post, kind of, where he's, he's playing these characters that are a bit, like, Lucas Scott is like, I think the the young women call it dreamboat these days. You know, he's he's the one that the the girls aspire to be with, and the guys aspire to be. Here, he's a bit more like. There's a little bit more unpleasantness to him, which, yeah, I really do appreciate. And you know, it's it's one of those things. The moment you have something like that, well, can the actor carry it? And he absolutely can. So, Wikipedia. A war veteran, an agent with the SSR, described as chauvinistic and chest-puffing, Murray compared the character to Indiana Jones, stated he's working his way up to become the head of the SSR. His goal in life is to just be great at his job. So he has a large chip on his shoulder, which gives him an attitude. Murray also noted that unlike his character on One Tree Hill, Thompson does not serve as the moral compass, which meant he would not be confined to a box and would instead be allowed to really play things up and do what's unexpected. And, yeah, I... I you know, it, you're not... You don't necessarily like the character. It's it's one of those things where he's not necessarily a likable character, but he is an interesting a hole, and I find the latter to be much more compelling. You know, so yeah, but definitely, you know, it's you're not necessarily gonna like him. You might hate his guts, and that's that means the show is is working. And. Enver Gyokaj plays Daniel Souza, war veteran, who's an agent with the SSR, experiences prejudice due to his injured leg. He accepts his injury, he accepts his compromised status in society. Peggy says, forget this, I'm Peggy Carter, I'm going to do something else. I think that's the difference between the two of them. And... Let's see... Yeah, and Shea Wiggum, who I feel like is popping up in everything I'm watching recently. Um, yeah. He plays Roger Dooley, the SSR chief who oversees agents Carter, Thompson, and Sousa. And Wiggum believes, unlike many of the other agents, Dooley does respect Carter, saying, I think he likes her. I think he cares deeply. I'm not sure that he can always show that. These are things that keep him up at night, as well as the other boys, when I send them out on missions. And I think that might be what I will get into for character. I've already talked some about dialogue. Um, all I'll add is basically every line is really well written and well delivered. You know, it's it's like there's an extra hurdle in that everyone has to, you know, the, the show starts in 1946. You know, basically, like, pretty much no one in the cast 
remembers 1946. A lot of them didn't weren't born yet, you know. So you you have to take on this affectation, and you have to deliver these lines with just you know, yeah. They they use words that you know, yeah. People don't use anymore. Let's see. And, and yeah, I, I really think that was the right choice. I know there are certain things... I've, I've seen stuff that's set in the, the past where they just talk the way they do today. You know, if I, yeah, off the top of my head, um, A Million Ways to Die in the West, for example, does that. You know, um, not a particularly good movie. Anyway, I'm, I really think it was the right choice for, for here. It, it is all, you know, in addition to it being consistent with... The first Captain America movie. Uh, right, right. Okay, yeah. There's a couple more characters I definitely do wanna wanna talk about. Um, Angie Martinelli. She's this waitress, actress, undiscovered actress. Works at the diner. Great relationship with Peg. Real firecracker. Calls her English because that's where she's from. See, ton of fun. Really, really glad that. Uh, yeah. Uh, right, and um, we also meet Anna Jarvis, the the yeah, the wife of Edwin Jarvis, and it's again one of those things where like you could, you know, they could have just said oh you know whatever she's domestic and called it a day, but no the she has personality, and. Right, uh, Dominic Cooper reprises his role as Howard Stark, and yeah, you know, there's he's he's phenomenal in in the role, has been from from day one. And okay, I'm just Kurt Wood Smith does appear on this show, and it's some of the best Kurt Wood Smith I've seen in in years. Like just you know, um. A little bit of it is even up to like the the kind of yeah the the kind of fun you have watching him in like RoboCop you know now yes uh, some of the characters are shown in various in, in tremendously varied circumstances so we see what they're like when things are going well how they respond to things going wrong and. Yeah, so the let's see. So the cinematography um let's see. Yeah, one of them did uh, cinematography for the Black Widow solo movie, the one shot Agent Carter, which very confusingly is not actually the pilot for this, but technically sort of set yeah. Uh, do I want to give that away? Any, anyway, you know, you're fine if you did watch that, but, you know, if you did watch that and then you watch the show, you're going to notice immediately it's clearly not, like, that did not happen before this is, is set. You know, there's at least one really major thing that makes that, yeah, it, it's, you know, it was a proof of concept more than a pilot Let's see, and yeah, he also DP'd the Marvel one-shot item 47, which was proof of concept for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Street Kings, uh, The Ring 2, SWAT, Blade 2, Tale of the Mummy. I didn't know mummies had tails. Oh, I misread it slightly. I get it now. It's British. It's like Mom's Tale. Makes perfect sense. The, the music video for Aerosmith's Crazy, the video for Crying, and let's see, yeah, and one of the, one of the DPs shot uh, two episodes of Heroes, five episodes of Lost, and I think that might be, yeah, that's what of it that I'm that there are other work that I'm familiar with. And yeah, you know, they're they're used to shooting TV. They've they've shot like some really gorgeous, really cinematic 
stuff. And yeah, they, they do a really solid job here. Like, you know, the way film, the way TV shows are filmed today really has, you know, it's, I suppose it's also a budget thing, but yeah, it's really, it's much bigger than, you know, the, the shows of like the early 2000s. And let's see the yeah the editing is is quite good there's uh, there are a couple of episodes that have like good parallel action where you know there there's multiple different things this is especially like in the last half or third of episodes so they're really ramping up the tension you know multiple different sources of danger and it'll cut between them in ways that keep you on your toes and you know yeah you know very very effective there's uh, on at least one occasion an episode will cut between flashback and I keep almost saying present day I did that when I did videos talking about the specific episodes that's obviously not quite accurate yeah to flashback and then the rest of the shows yeah, what's what's present day by the show's standards. And these tend to work quite well and you know, yeah, uh, you know, flashbacks, it's not really rocket science. They can give you a good idea of where a character came from which can really inform where they are now, why they're behaving the way they are. It can be a bit of like just lazy writing and just, you know, it's it can be a little bit easy you know, so, but the show tends to use it well. There, there was at least one episode where at first I was like, why did they show us that? But then later, you know, they built on it. And I I would say that every every use of flashback is, is very, very good in this show. The special effects are almost all great. Um, there's... They, they don't rely too heavily on CG, like they tend to like cut away from a CG shot after not very long, but the CG there is, is very impressive, you know, it's, yeah, goes way beyond what TV used to allow for, um, network TV at least, and it, you know, it is very much a show that is within the MCU, so there are, yeah, I, I did somewhat already allude to, there are world-ending threats on this show, you know. This was a time when the MCU wasn't really, it didn't feel quite ready to move away from that yet, and there was an expectation, you know, which these days, less so. And, yeah, there's some really excellent stunt work, and the production design is is immaculate like cuz that that is the thing like everywhere every every single set they they have to at the very least check to make sure there's no modern technology and many of them yeah they have to completely redress them you know to to make it feel like it could be back then even MCU version of back then and yeah, they, they really do an incredible job on it. And let's see, there are... Yeah, there is some um, location shooting, and it works quite well, really adds to the, the, um, the authenticity. And... Yeah, so the action has a, a decent amount of variety. Um, you know, chases on foot and vehicles, physical fights, shooting, including shooting while in vehicles, and some like super powered items, equipment, and such. And yeah, also a, a good amount of tension. And, yeah, so the, the music was handled by uh, Christopher Lennertz, 
who has done a bunch of video games, 2000s and post parody movies. Somebody had to score those. And yeah, uh, he's done other TV. Uh, let's see, he did. I swear it was right here. Um, And it's gone. I cannot for the life of me find. But yeah. Um, the music also really sounds like, you know, they, they make the, the wise choice that the music tends to... F yeah, I, I'm not sure there's any exceptions. It sounds like it could have been composed and performed at the time. You know, there's no, like, really modern you know yeah and I, I think that was the the right choice and there's also a, a lot of great needle drops right he composed for the Punisher 2004 tie-in video game which I think he did fantastic for and the score for that is completely different from the score for this so it's not just you know oh he knows how to do one thing you know the the music for that game which I probably talk about I probably talk about that game way more than anyone wants me to but I kind of love, like, there's a lot I love about that game. I've spent many hours of my life playing it. Anyway, the music in that game tends to be this kind of operatic, like, you know, it's making it feel like the biggest thing, which, you know, it's a, it's a game where you run around shooting, you know, criminals. So, yeah, you're, it, it makes a lot of sense to, to go there. But it's like... I, I'm not sure I know of another shooting game that goes for quite as operatic a feel there. Which, you know, yeah, like, Punisher feels like this is his mission, this is his life's work, this is big. And they also want to keep your energy high. And... That... Uh, about. Right, uh, there's a couple of episodes that do things that are very unusual. There's a heist episode. Uh, you know, there's... Uh, I don't want to give away... I th yeah, I, th I think I will just leave it at that. But it, yeah, it's a really solid heist. And yeah, the sound design is quite good. And... You know that it's 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 important for a show where there's a lot of people punching each other that the punches sound like you know they actually hit hard and that is about it so yes um, the best elements it's a tie between more of Haley Atwell playing the titular character this you know the the period setting and how well that's used and the yeah when it really nails the female empowerment it, yeah and yeah overall the the worst aspect and and again you know that is something i i try to force myself to say something negative about because i do a lot of positive videos these days I think videos that say absolutely nothing negative about a subject can end up... It's, it's not my favorite thing to do, at the very least. The worst aspect. While I agree with the feminism, I think a, a bunch of the time it's just not handled as well as it could be. And, yeah. Um, reading other people's reviews, like, a lot of it was just... It shouldn't be feminist because feminism is bad. So, you know, I've pretty much already made my views clear on, yeah. Um, I I do kind of like I I think it is it is very impressive to go into a show based on like if you watched Captain America one and you heard oh Peggy Carter got her own show. And you went into this not expecting feminism? Like, did you close your eyes whenever she was on screen in the movie? Like, holy crap. 
Anyway, um, yeah, the thing I was most worried about was the, yeah, badly done fen fe feminism. And, yeah, what I was most looking forward to was MCU post-World War II stuff, and the show delivered on that. And, yeah, um, both seasons, whether we're talking opener, finale, or overall season, all the way great. You know, I, I love every episode. Not all of them equally, but there's no episode of this that I just thought, oh, that was just bad from start to finish. Um, I meant to rewatch the trailers. Uh, from what I recall, they give at least a little bit too much away. That's, you know, trailers today tend to, but also give you a pretty good idea of what the show is like. The cover and poster don't give too much away and do give you a good idea. Like, the, the, um, I forget if there's more than one now real quick. Uh, yeah, so, you know, some of the, the posters, it's Peggy standing in, in this, you know, blue dress, red hat, very striking, and she's like, in one of them she's got her gun pointed at someone, and in the other hand she's got her, her, um, sunglasses, you know, so it's this great contrast between the implied violence that's about to take place and how frickin' good she looks doing it, you know. There's another one where she's holding the gun but pointed down, you know. Some, some, yeah. You know, it's, it's underlining this thing of, you know, she kicks ass and looks good doing it. And... Right, um, I really appreciate that the posters don't focus on her you know, looking conventionally attractive. I wish the show itself never did, but, you know, it is also, it's not constantly doing it, at least, the the show. Um, let's see, then... Yes, that brings us to Rotten Tomatoes, where it has a 96% from critics, based on 50 reviews, only two of them rotten, and an 84% from audiences based on over 2,500 ratings and an average of 4.1 out of 5. The consensus, focusing on Peggy Carter as a person first and action hero second, makes Marvel's Agent Carter a winning stylish drama with bursts of excitement and an undercurrent of cheeky fun. I kind of want to know what the two negative, what are the two rotten ones saying? Um, let's see. Okay, this kind of sounds like... Okay, yeah, so so this person says that the... Yeah, ABC's new period entertainment marketing opportunity, Sleep Aid. Wow, okay. It, yeah, I guess one person had to find it boring. But yeah, I, I get, you know, marketing opportunity, like... Yeah, the MCU... It's, it is kind of ridiculous how big it's, uh, yeah. And let's see. Yeah, one one person says, it's a it's dull, a too simplistic gloss on post-war gender dynamics. So yeah, absolutely agreed. Uh, let's see. So the... <clears throat> Oh, right, right. That was season one. Season two has a 76%. Uh, based on 21 reviews, 16 fresh, 5 rotten, and a 70% based on over a thousand ratings by users. And the average rating is 3.5 out of 5, down from 4.1. And... Yeah, so, you know... As mentioned before, you know, I'm, I'm not the only person who thinks that season two is a little less, yeah. Still pretty good ratings, but a little less. On Metacritic, it has a 73, generally favorable, out of 100, based on 30 critic reviews, 
20, uh, yeah, yeah, 24 of them, 80% positive, 3 makes 3 negative, accounting for 10% each, and let's see the, um, one person says it has all the things I'd like in a show, none of the energy to hold them together, and... This one person says the the two hours the first two hours leaving with a lot of mumbo jumbo. I yeah I disagree, but they're entitled to their opinion. Yeah, one person says it's safe, but safe is nothing to write home about. And yeah, one person says it's sort of a shame that it's not more compelling which yeah you know it's I definitely prefer the first three seasons of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. to this you know and the first let's see was the first season and a half or so aired before this aired at all so you know I, th I think it's fair to compare they're even on the same network and everything one person says it's not great yet, though it has potential. Now, user ratings left it at 7.7 .7 out of 10, for, generally favorable. 434 user ratings, and yeah, 349 of them positive, 46 negative, 39 mixed, and yeah. Uh, let's see, there's one French, I, there's one French negative, I don't usually, I know I could use Google Translate, but it gives me a headache to try to re-jigger the, the grammar. There's one mixed, um, let's see, huh, okay, um, Okay, yeah, one person does not like the fact that there's a romantic interest for Peggy. He feels it belitter, belittles the, the story of Peggy and Steve. I suppose I can see what they mean. I, I disagree, but they're entitled to their opinion. It's not like nonsense or something. They'd still be entitled to their opinion, I'm just saying. Uh, let's see. And yeah, the rest of them are positive. Now on IMDB there are hold on, there we go. There are 179 user reviews or 149 if you hide spoilers, which is really not very much for something so recent. Um yeah. I read the top voted 100 or did I? Actually, no, yeah, I think I ended up reading all of them since there's so few. And there are 39 links in the IMDb external review section, and I was able to read 14 of them, so they're in English and not dead links. The user rating overall comes on IMDb comes out to 7.8 out of 10, based on 88,000 uh, votes. 29.1% Tw uh, gave it 8. 21.4 gave it 10, 18.9 gave it 9, 17.3 gave it 7, 6.6 .6 gave it 6, 2.6 gave it 5, 1.9 gave it 1, 1.1 gave it 4, 0 0.7 gave it 3, 0 0.5 gave it 2. And yeah, so it ultimately it didn't win any awards, but it was nominated for 14. And Right, so I already mentioned that the, the CGI is largely convincing. Um, they, they managed to have like a weight to it, so it doesn't feel like we're just watching, you know, what we are watching is literally just like, yeah, you know, someone made in the computer. It's not easy, and they definitely deserve a raise, they deserve to be treated better, but, you know, there's a lot of movies that have 
CG where they don't really do a lot to help sell it on the other end, and they, yeah, they tend to try to find something like maybe the the CGI thing will like have a str give off some light, or maybe even like maybe maybe it like pushes stuff back or something. And yeah, they'll do a reaction shot, and you know, obviously off camera, they'll have a light pointed at you know an unusually strong light pointed at them. They'll maybe have like a, a wind machine or something, you know, to to help sell it, along with the acting performance, the the reaction shots, which are quite convincing. Which you know, it's not easy selling. You know, we're we're looking at a thing that isn't actually there. And, yeah, um, I rate this 8 badass women out of 10. And I definitely think, you know, it feels silly to say for such for a show that isn't, you know, very old. Like, it went off the air 7 years ago, it went on the air 8 years ago, but no, it holds up. It's not the kind of thing, you know, sometimes you look at something that came out, before and it really does not feel very yeah um, this is not one of those and let's see yeah I, I I think it deserves it deserved better I I I could definitely see how this could have gotten like you know agents of Sheila ended up getting seven seasons this could have gotten this could definitely have run for for seven seasons. There's enough there that they can work with. Um, yeah, the I think overall, yeah, um, I would say that the the yeah ranked worst to best. Though I love all of them. The the very first, hmm, actually, yeah, I guess the first episode of the second season is my least favorite opener of of these shows, and then comes the one for the first season, and then yeah, uh, season one of Agents of Shield, season two of Agents of Shield, season three of Agents of Shield. And uh, it's difficult to say about. Yeah, overall, same thing for the season finales of these five seasons of these two shows. And I think that probably is also the overall for. Yeah. For overall seasons is probably also that, yeah. So, uh, let me know who was your favorite character, what was your favorite episode or scene, and if they do bring this, if, if they bring some of this stuff back for Disney Plus at some point, who would you most want to see return? If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. One talking about the most recently aired episode of A Murder at the End of the World. The most recent episode of Personally Unaround Watching of Blood Curse. And, uh, let's see, yeah, and, and usually I also try to do an episode per day of one of these Marvel shows, um, but I'm going to be taking a small break from that, um, yeah, probably until about the end of the year. But in, let's see, in a little over two weeks, it's because I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing a, an advent calendar daily now, and it's getting... I, I don't want to stress over doing a daily video. Anyway, um, I want to say it's the 22nd. We d start getting an episode a day of season two of What If. So there is that. 
and recently reviews the view and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, but with thoughts in the same video instead of in a separate video, since a movie's running time is significantly shorter than a show. In other words, if you want videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back channel, this was Cash Man next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.